Right, have you seen Pacific Rim? It's a good movie. Like Pacific Rim, Darling in the Franks is also about big robots operated by two people fighting big monsters. Also, this is modern day anime, so you know they found a way to make it look weird. In fact, the first few episodes smelled just a little like Shimoneta for hidden dirty jokes. In particular, how these people talk about piloting big robots like it's sex, so immediate points for cleverness. Before I came near the series, I heard people clamoring, my waifu, my waifu, and I asked myself, who is this Zero Two that everyone is so infatuated with her? So I go into the first episode, and the second time she's seen is when the protagonist first meets her, having found her swimming naked in a lake, and she reacts with all the modesty of Rhea's grimmery. Is that it, guys? Is this our best girl 2018? She has nothing on my milhior. Zero Two has rumors spread about her that anyone who rides in a big robot unit with her three times will certainly die. However, Zero One Six, aka Hero, doesn't care. He insists on piloting a big robot or he's of no use to anyone, which brings me to my first question. Why are these kids told that there's only one option? Surely someone is paid to fix the robots and do laundry right, but I guess it makes sense if teenagers are the target audience and the series doesn't care if I remember I'm watching a TV show. Anyway, will he risk his life to team up with the girl who's so questionable she literally has horns and fangs to do so? Of course he will. So second question, why do the big robots require boy-girl pairs? Oh, I remember that explanation now, and it sucked. But back on the matter of Hero and Zero Two. I don't mind a character who is willing to sacrifice their self to get what they want. It's part of what burned Yuno Gasai into my heart. But this is the second or third thing we learn about him, so I wondered, if he doesn't care if he lives or dies, then why should I? Now I'm going to recommend this later, but first let me have my fun nitpicking. Zero Two shows Hero a cityscape he's never seen before, and he regards it with astonishment, but the same cityscape was seen by two others the same rank as him through an elevator later, and seemed to regard that as everyday life, but then their whole squad gets to see the city at a later time, and every one of them was tickled pink, except Zero Two. It would break her character type if she were impressed by the same thing as everyone else. And remember what I said about people dying after riding with Zero Two three times? Hero was starting to develop a biological reaction after riding two times with Zero Two, but in Episode 6, Hero magically heals himself when he was about to die via sheer willpower. That's called plot armor, the sort of thing you do if you want me to remember I'm watching a TV show. Very true, and it made me wonder how he got sick in the first place, but no spoilers from me! The society that rules over the main characters want to come across as logic-based, but insist on using magma flow to power their homes and charge their phones, etc., when that's what attracts the big monsters in the first place. Episode 7 confirms that this is a sort of post-apocalyptic version of a world much like ours. What happened to good old-fashioned electricity? You want clean energy? How about solar panels and windmills? Sorry, they don't fulfill the selfish desires I won't go into right now, but think about it logically, logic-based society. Episode 20 was an awfully busy time for you, wasn't it? Let's talk about the relationships here. Best I can gather, the young guys start with no idea what romance is. The girls seem to understand the concept of romance and even expect the guys to as well. I guess the girls' dorm got the Hallmark Channel, but a watered-down Hallmark Channel at that since they don't know about any physical expression of romance. Zero Two, however, has an almost complete understanding of romance, which is explained eventually, but for the most part, it can be inferred that she knows these things because that's what her character type calls for. Darling in the Franks has a couple of interesting points, one of which is Zero Two a good fit for Hero. Aside from her obvious inability to remember his name, the series doesn't seem aware that it spoils this in Episode 4 when their minds were linked and Hero said, It's like I'm deep inside of you. I can't tell where I end and you begin. And I thought we were done with the matter. Then Episode 13 comes along, does a cliché heartwarming thing that marked the only time I felt more than a little emotion towards the series, and then they knew each other as well as I thought they did. Now you can have as many plot holes and oddities as you like. My favorite anime has more holes than any Swiss cheese you've ever seen, as long as there are things worth seeing about the anime in question. And I said I was going to recommend this series, and here we are. This series drives home a sense of defying duty for your love. Camera movement captures the eye, it asks what it means to be human, it builds a detailed world, good character development, and good humor in places. It's a fair enough way to spend your day, all things considered, but doesn't live to the hype. 
I believe anything that takes over seven episodes to get into it has something fundamentally wrong with it. Episode 17 was so cringy, I almost dropped it then and there. In fact, I'm on episode 20 now, and I'm frankly undecided if I'm going to finish this on my own time. But what stuck out to me the most is that I wasn't invested in Zero Two. She got the best character development out of all of them, and quite frankly should be my cup of tea, so what's the difference between these pink-haired romantics with issues? I thought long and hard on this and came to two conclusions. First off, she's done a lot to be with him, but she hasn't done a thing for him. Take episode 1 of each show, for instance. You know asserts her position as lead female and saves her man's life. Zero Two asserts her position as lead female and talks dirty for the amusement of the audience, which brings me to my second point, marketability. I'm not blaming her for being sexy. You know herself has a nice tushy, but that's just something I chose to notice. Zero Two and her flirtatious behavioral patterns, however, exist to be shared by the viewer and the plot. She does not exist for her man. And when I realized this, I was reminded of something. I'm watching a TV show.